Our next speaker is Mother Dolores Hart. I can't wait for this. Uh, Dolores Hart began her career as an actress when she was only 19 years old, making her screen debut in 1957 as Elvis Presley's sweetheart in Loving You. I'll tell you. I think they kissed on screen. I, I, don't hold me to that, but that's what I've heard. At the height of her career, Dolores stunned the world by making the decision to become a cloistered nun and enter the Abbey of Regina Laudis. The prioress of Regina Laudis, Mother Dolores, has helped generations of young people to bring forth their own gifts and to realize their own unique call to become, as blessed John Paul II, Saint John Paul, the script said blessed, got to catch up, Saint John Paul II called a true acting person. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the 19th Annual Eucharistic Congress, Mother Dolores Hart. to thank you very much, all of you, for coming this afternoon. But first of all, I want to say a thank you to Archbishop Gregory Wilton for this invitation and for all those who have worked here to make this Congress such a wonderful and welcoming place. It has really been good. This actually is the last stop for me on my um, time out because I um, started by the grace of Ignatius Press and uh, Lisa Wheeler, our press agent, who came to my rescue when I wrote a book for them called The Ear of the Heart. And they sent me all over the country to um, try to sell it. <laughs> and my abbess finally said to me, you are an enclosed nun. You're not the flying nun, so. <laughs> Will you please make up your mind to come back where you belong? But I said I had made a promise, and the promise was to come here at the conclusion. And I think one of the deep reasons I want to talk to you, my friends, is to tell you what an amazing gift it has been to know the power of Christ's life, guiding you and taking you through an amazing life. My father and mother were married in 1937, and I came along a year later. My father was a look-alike for Clark Gable. And so when the press agent saw him, he was an usher. And they said, would you go to Hollywood? And he said, on a nickel I would go. <laughs> And mom said, I'd better go too or I won't keep him. But my grandmother said, no, no, the baby stays with me. I paid the bill at the Edgewater Beach Hospital for her. And so that was the beginning for me of a life of many amazing separations. And I came, to, I came to understand what a wound being separated is for our human nature, but separated from those whom we love. And what started out to be a terribly difficult pain eventually I learned was the grace of my life. Because when you understand separation, 
you begin to understand who you love and why you are feeling this way. Because you love someone and you want to be with them. And for children, that first step is a mother, a father. And eventually, for me, it was a grandparent, both of them. My grandfather was a projectionist in the theater in Chicago. And I went with him every weekend while he slept, and I watched the film. And I would get 25 cents if I woke him up so he could change the reel. <laughs> but I was watching that movie because I was hoping I'd find my dad. I watched them all. Betty Hutton in Annie Get Your Gun. <laughs> there was a whole train of those films, which made me say, at the age of seven, when I grow up, I'm going to be a movie star. Of course, all of my kids were children I played with. They razzed me terribly. And I remember being with a group of the little kids, little girls, and they did dress-up dolls, you know, the dress-up of all the, the movie actresses that were, and they would put paper clothes on them. And I stormed out of the room and went and sat in the window. And I remember saying to myself, they don't know, they've got the real thing here. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when something is in your being, in your heart, and you really go for it, and you really ask God for it. It's amazing how often you actually get the very thing that you've been praying for. I tried my best in school. I did all of the playing. I played St. Joan of Arc 15 times, I think. And I won a scholarship to college on the very um, play. I heard that the fellows at Loyola University were doing that play. So as a freshman, quite angering my sisters at school, I got the part at the boys' college. Well, in the course of that, the same thing happened that happened to my dad. There was a, a talent scout who called me on the phone after one of the shows and said, we would like very much to give you a, a movie, um, what they call it now? Uh, uh, well, you know, when you try out for a movie. <laughs> That's right, you got it. <laughs> well. He called me and I said, are you one of my boyfriends giving me a razz? <laughs> he said, you know, your mother said the same thing when I called her because you're underage, so I had to get her permission. <laughs> so I said, okay, all right, you got me. And I went to Paramount and went into that glass room that they had at that time to do my scene. I didn't know who was there because they were all on the other side of the glass. Well, very shortly they told me I had the, the, the screen test. And would I come in because Mr. Hal Wallace wanted to sign me to a contract to do a film with three major players at that time. Liz Scott, Wendell Corey, and a young man named Elvis Presley who was making his first color film. So I went in and sat down in the room to meet them. I was so impressed with Liz Scott. I thought she was the greatest thing I had ever seen. And Wendell Corey was my grandmother's favorite. And I turned to the young man who said, my name is Elvis Presley. And I said, and what do you do? <laughs> I 
I'm telling you, being in religious life was very, well, I'm going ahead of myself. It was a lot like being in a religious school. You didn't see movies or television very often. So I didn't know that um, he had just been on the Ed Somebody show and they only showed him from the waist down, or, or the waist up, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I'm telling you, we had a wonderful time on that film. And when I got to know Mr. Presley, even when I was not in one of the scenes, I would go and watch him sing because I have never seen anyone with the magnetism and the charm and the quality of life that he brought when he stood up and and sang Love With You or any of the songs in the film, I said, I think they're right. I think he's a good bet. <laughs> well, we did that film, and Mr. Wallace said, I would like to sign you to a seven-year contract, which blew my mind, so I had to leave school and go find an apartment. I think it was on Flores Avenue, which is now, I think, I think that's the, 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 the red, uh, it's a red path now. You don't go there. <laughs> but <laughs> but 50, 52 years ago, 53 years ago, I did. It was 19, 1970, no, 57. That's when I got the contract. Well, it was amazing because after the film with Elvis, I got a film with Anna Magnani and Anthony Quinn. And let me tell you, if I had you all afternoon, I could tell you about that story. It was an amazing um, experience of really fine actors. Anna Magnani, I had one major scene with her. And beforehand, she walked into the um, I guess it was a sound stage, and she looked at me, and she looked at the director, and she said, she can't, she can't do that. She's not good. She's got blue eyes. She'll never be an Italian. <laughs> and George Cooker looked at me and said, you're going to have your hair dyed, and you're going to have um, something put on your eyes. You're going to be very Italian. And I remembered one line from the play, and it said, Papa non piace parlare italiano. <laughs> and he said, you didn't say it right. You go now with the, the director, with the assistant. I want you back here at 2 o'clock, and I want you to know the whole scene in Italian. Well, we got there by 2 o'clock, and Anna Magnani did not follow the script at all. It was the only thing you could do was look in her eyes and hear her and respond from the heart. And I said, that's why she is so great as an actress. She listens. People don't think so, maybe. But she listens and she responds. And I knew years later after I had been in films for maybe five years, and now I had blonde hair, and I was a whole other creature. And I went to the, um, the, the director, and he said, you know, you really don't know that film, I mean, that's, that scene in the film, you really did it very badly. We've got to do it again. He said, Dolores, you know, I think there's a, there's a movie playing around the corner. It's an Italian movie. And there's a girl in that movie. You should go and watch her because she really knows how to act. She looks a lot like you. <laughs> you got the story. <laughs> 
I told him, I said, look, I don't need, I don't want acting lessons anymore. What I want to do is remember the heart, to hear and experience what is in your heart. Well, I don't have too much longer with you, so I want to get to the point of what this is about, because a number of years followed, and I went into a film called Lisa with Stephen Boyd about a girl who had been in Auschwitz. And it was the first time in my young life that I ever realized what a nation was asked to do when the Jewish people were stripped of their dignity and sent into camps to die. I was totally undone. And I thought to myself, what is this reason for our life? And it, I was in a play in New York right after that, a couple of years. A, a, the play was with Cyril Richard and Cornelia Otis Skinner. And after a year in that play, I was so fatigued and still, still anguishing about this matter. They told me to go to a place in Bethlehem, Connecticut, because they said, you could rest up there. I said, what is it? And they said, it's a monastery. I said, are there nuns there? And they said, yes, but they don't talk. <laughs> so nobody will try to convince me of anything else. So I went to, I went to Regina Laudis, and you know, the moment I stepped on the soil, I knew something in me was home. And I'd asked the abbess, who was Mother Benedict Bass, the foundress, if she could see me. And I said, do you think I could possibly be meant for this life? And she looked at me and she said, Dolores, go back and do your movie thing. <laughs> you are too young. <laughs> you need a lot more experience under your belt. Well, I was so relieved. <laughs> but in the next couple of years, I got engaged to be married to a very lovely young man named Don Robinson. And one night we were going to a party to celebrate our forthcoming engagement. And after that we got back, in, or rather we got into the car to go back to where I lived. And suddenly he stopped the car in the middle of the road. And he said, you didn't enjoy yourself at all. You had a lousy time. Where were you? Do you have another guy? I said, Don, what a terrible thing to say. Of course not. He said, yes, but I know you weren't there. I think you should go back to that monastery and think things over. He did not know then what I had been originally thinking, but I did go back very soon the next day, and I asked to see Mother Abbess again, and she said, all right, let's give it a try. But June Haver just went in and left. So I'm asking you not to become a, a statistic. Please don't tell anyone what you're doing. I said, well, I've got to tell Don. And she said, well, that's all right. But please keep it out of the papers. So it was about six months I had to prepare to come into the monastery. I can't begin to tell you how, well, we went to see the bishop, for example, in Los Angeles, and he said, do you like to do dishes? And I said, well, not really. I have a lady who helps me, and he said, what about housework? How are you on housework? And I said, well, the same person comes in and, and helps me, because you see, I have a job. And he said, well, what about 
do you like to get dirt under your fingernails? Because gardening is very, very part, much part of, of an, a monastery. And I said, no, I hate it. <laughs> he looked at Don and he said, you know, I don't think that this girl should go into a monastery. And furthermore, I don't think you should marry her. <laughs> Well, it was like that. It was, I mean, it was just unbelievable. And we finally, I finally got to the gate on the feast of Corpus Christi, 1963. And I knocked on the gate. It was a huge gate that they asked you to go through in the garden. And the abbess was on the other side. And she said, what do you seek? And I said, I don't know. I want to know the Lord Jesus. That's all I know. And she said, that's pretty good. <laughs> well, the first night in the monastery, I felt like I had fallen from a 20-story building and landed right on my <laughs> I could not believe what had happened because I put my arms out. I could feel the wall on one side of the room and the other, just like this. It was that small. I think the first years there were unbelievably difficult to make the change. And the change, as I understood it, was not to be the center of my own egotistical need, to understand that when you find the Lord Jesus, you find someone else. You have to look in the eyes of someone else who needs you, who is asking something from you, who is hurt, who has a wound, a wound like mine, separation, anxiety. And you have to understand that that wound has to be met and changed. Well, when I was about six months in the monastery, I wrote a letter to the abbess telling her all the things that I thought should be changed. I hadn't quite got the principle yet. I was still applying it to myself. <laughs> she called me to her office and she said, Dolores, I think what you have to do is see if you can obey a few rules. <laughs> well, seven years passed. And I finally did take final vows and consecration. And <laughs> that's, that's very, very beautiful that you acknowledge that, that step because that was an amazing gift. It was a gift. And in that, maybe I was called me up to the same office and she pulled out the same letter and she said Mother Dolores you know there are a lot of things that you wrote to me a few years ago and I would like to have done it myself <laughs> but I couldn't but I'm going to ask you now to be the Dean of Education and help me put some of these into effect and I said oh but Mother don't say Dean of Education I left college. I don't have a degree. I, I'm really not that smart. You know? <laughs> and she said, what I'm talking about is street smart. It's a different kind of education. And you've been through a lot of it. See, part of my story, which I didn't tell you, was my father did go to New York to do Wing Victory. 
and there he met a young guy named Johnny Cocosa who sang beautifully. And he said, I can take you to Hollywood and get you a contract. They went and he got the contract. But Joe Pasternak said, we have to change your name. I said, what to? He said, well, what was your family name? Lanza. He said, all right, how about Mario Lanza? Well, he had just married my Aunt Betty and become a member of the family. And that story, all of you know, was amazingly beautiful, very intense, and very tragic. The tragedy of what happened to that family and those children, I witnessed firsthand because I loved them and I took care of them. And a lot of it reflected back on my own family. And so when this time came in the Abbey to become Dean, it occurred to me very clearly that people cannot live by restriction. Restriction does not give you energy. Innovation is what gives you the energy. You know something inside that has to come forth. And so we began a whole movement in the community which allowed the young people to find out how they were hurt and what it was that they did, what could they do, what was their value, what was their gift, what was their bonum, the thing that was in their family that made them unique. And the realization that every single human being in that community, as in you, each one of you, was created by God in a unique gift. When you were conceived, there were how many hundred thousand sperm went forth and one, one was taken. That is an amazing predilection. And that one becomes a baby with a life. And that baby at six weeks old has fingerprints already. And so this was something that we had to really face in the community. What was the gift of each woman? And how could it be used to employ and make the community life come to its full meaning? That was 19... 75, 1980 that we began. I have been there now 50 years and I am so pleased to see what a difference it makes when a community is built on love and the energy of that love coming forth in relationship. And that can only happen, first of all, when you know who you are, what you can do, what's your best gift, and who wants that? Who can help you? There are triads, there are complements, there are many forms of life that come when people gather together. And I think the mystery that we are celebrating today Send forth your disciples. That's how it works. You have to come into some relationship that means your life and makes your life worthwhile. Because in that communion of relationship and truth, you set the, you set the form for eternity because God did not make all of this wonderful, unbelievable life stream 
for nothing. It's, he said when he came to earth, he told us, I don't remember the exact words, somebody, somebody who's very intelligent with a degree can tell me. But I remember the meaning. The meaning was, you go forth and make disciples for all nations forever. And in the, in the beginning, when you first hear those words, you first hear that, you think, oh, that's for somebody else. That's for somebody who is, has the capacity to deal with it, to understand it. It sounds like a fable, but Jesus was not a fable. He wasn't part of a historical stream all saying the wish of mankind that they could get through the evil spirit. He was saying, I have conquered this spirit. I have stood against the spirit that wants to destroy your life. And I am real. And you will find this person probably sitting next to you, maybe sitting in front of you, the one you love, the one who will take you through the violence of your own fight for separation, whatever it is. Someone will help you to know that that terrible loneliness, that terrible anguish, the terrible loss when someone dies that you love, that is not the end. Our life is going into a new experience. I mean, when you look at what they have done in digital life in these last few years, now somebody can say, oh, that drives me nuts. I can't bear it, I, I don't know, but really, practical part is that is the work of the spirit. The spirit is bringing people together. When I was a young kid, I would never have thought of picking up something here in my pocket, <laughs> dialing it, and talking to someone in California. No, I'd have to go and wait to get the telephone because it was a party line. And also to get someone in Italy. I was just there for reasons for the monastery and had the unbelievable experience of kissing the ring of the Holy Father. I had been given this seat because they thought it was a good seat and there were two huge people right in front of me. I mean, one was 280 pounds and the next one couldn't have been less. <laughs> and I thought, as he left the altar and began going around speaking to the people, I thought, I'm, I'm done for. I will never, never. This is, this is a sad ending to this trip. So I was sitting there, and the, all I could see was backs. And suddenly, I looked down on the rail, and there was a man's hand with a ring. And in the, our custom, you always kiss the ring of the abbess, or of the archbishop, or whoever is your authority. That was a sign of your, 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 your witnessing to holiness. I saw that ring. I grabbed the hand and reached down and kissed that ring. And suddenly those two big sides opened up. <laughs> and I looked up into the face of Pope Francis. 
and everything that I have ever believed about the mystery of Christ and Jesus coming to you through a beloved, I will never forget that moment as I saw his face and a smile that said to me, you're okay, kid. <laughs> I'm 75, and believe me, when somebody looks at me like, you're okay, kid, I really feel good. <laughs> Especially when it's the Pope. <laughs> so, I just, I know that we're, I think we're almost running on time here, and they want me to go. Um, my press agent, Lisa, said to me as I came up, don't forget to tell folks you will sign their book if they buy it after this. <laughs> so, Lisa, wherever you are, I did it. <laughs> there, there. She, uh, let me tell you, she has four babies, four little children, and she is the greatest agent you would ever want in your life. I think that that's another answer to love, that love pierces all of the things that say you can't. So, my friends, I want to thank you very much for these final... Here she's crying. <laughs> I want to thank you because my abbess is going to be, abbess David is her name, Mother David. She will be very happy to know that we have come to the end of the line today and it was this wonderful. You have been a splendid audience and I wish I could look into each eyes, each eye. <laughs> and I think I have in a way that is very mysterious because when you look down and you see the faces that God has created looking up at you and you see the joy, you know, as, as the Archbishop said at Mass last night, I think that you always have to keep that smile and that love in your heart that says, I am Jesus in here and I will be for you because I love you is the best three words we have ever written. God bless you. Well, Mother Dolores, we, we are indeed blessed that this was your last stop. Thank you for sharing your grace with us this afternoon.